Hey YouTube, it's Pastor Dwayne here. So I made good on my promise and I watched the cessationist documentary from start to finish. It was like almost two hours long and I watched the whole thing. My wife and I, kids went to bed. We had a date night on the couch. We did not want our children exposed to that. We hid our children's eyes from the cessationist documentary. <laughs> no, you just wanted to watch it in peace and quiet. That's the real truth of the matter. <laughs> so anyway, so let me, so, so in this video, I just want to give you some brief thoughts about the documentary. Now that I've watched it, I've watched it once. And to be fair, you know, I, I watched it with a uh, preconceived notion of what to expect. And I think it really did fulfill my expectations and not necessarily in a good way, but not really in a bad way either. I think the documentary was more like a popular appeal uh, to some of the arguments that we see in regards to whether continuationism is true or not. There isn't really anything totally in depth. They covered a lot of topics, but they didn't go deeply into those topics. And and in all fairness, I don't think a two-hour documentary could do justice to the entire conversation. So entire books have been written about continuationism and about cessationism. So who do I think the intended audience was? Um, I didn't read any of the blurbs or anything. I just watched it. And it seems to me that the intended audience for this documentary is going to be cessationists. I think as a continuationist, if you were to go and watch that, you would probably find yourself frustrated from hearing the same old arguments, right, uh, that we've heard. Uh, to its credit, I did hear one argument in the documentary that I have never heard before, and I'm going to take some time and, and review some of the information on that. Um, I don't know necessarily if it's a new argument per se, but just one that I haven't heard before. There were only really three epochs in which the gifts really, um, in which miraculous gifts and stuff seem to have gone on. And, and they quote, you know, the time of Moses, we saw a lot of miraculous gifts and the children coming out of Egypt, of course, right? And the, the Red Sea crossing and the pillar of fire by uh, night and the pillar and the, and the cloud by day. Uh, and then the next epoch was, of course, when Elijah was roaming the earth and all the, the miracles and the crazy things that seemed to follow him and Elisha around. And then the third epoch being, of course, the time of the apostles and the miracles we see to go and validate the message of the gospel. So that was a new argument for me. Uh, just, just immediately, without even really diving into it, I, I can think of a few instances where miracles and such happen outside of those three epochs. One would be like the period of the judges. We see like, uh, Samson uh, doing great and wonders, uh, marvelous works, you know, his his strength and and uh, beating 300 soldiers with like the jawbone of a donkey and like just supernatural strength. Right. And then you have Gideon and some of the miracles that kind of surrounded him, especially when it comes to making the armies flee. You go a little bit earlier, right? A little bit of time after Moses when they're when they're walking into the promised land and they go and they they, they go in and they take the city of Jericho. You know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. <laughs> they went in and they they walked around and blew the trumpets and the walls fell down right i don't know how we justify three epochs again this is just a quick thought on what i think of that um I, i'm going to look into that a little bit further and as we continue in our video series we'll we'll dedicate a little bit more time to that the other thing that was really expected i found in the video was the was the broad brushing right we see that when it comes to the discussion between continuationism and cessationism i find what often happens and it was no different in in the video here is they'll take the worst examples of continuationism and i'm thinking like the worst of the worst like todd bentley uh by mr biker boot right you know he he actually came to a place once and we we went to one of his conferences back in london ontario and this was a number of years ago he, he was at the uh the greek orthodox center i remember going with my my good friends uh at the time and and about 10 minutes in i think i think they were singing like leaving on a jet plane for a worship song and then we just started and he, he started going out and calling out names and saying things that, like in this sort of really generic in this really generic fashion. And of course, <laughs> I'm looking over at my buddy here and he's looking at me and we're just kind of like, you know, and the conversation in the car afterwards was like, well, that was junk. And of course, I'm a continuationist and and uh, we saw what was happening there, right? <laughs> like, you know, we need discernment. I get that. I get that. Uh, if anything at all, the call again from the cessationist documentary, from the mind of a continuationist here, right? 
the takeaway seems to be like, you know, be on the up and up on discernment, right? Like if you have a guy running around on a stage kicking ladies in the face with a biker boot, that's a good sign. The Holy Spirit is not in it. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so they take so they take people like Todd Bentley. They I almost said Todd Friel. Oh boy, that's a mix up. <laughs> Poor Todd Friel. Uh, they take people like Todd Bentley, uh, people like Benny Hinn, uh, Kenneth Copeland. My goodness, Paula White. You know, you mash in some Bethel in there and you mash in some Stephen Furtick in there. And uh, I, I don't know if Stephen Furtick's really pertinent to the conversation. Either, either way, you get what I'm saying. They mash them all together and they come up with this like super, super charismatic doctrine. And from that, they they tend to make this into a straw man, into this is the way continuationism is. And they build up the straw man and then they attack that straw man like that represents continuationism around the world. And I just don't, I, we'll, we'll talk about that more. What I want to do is, is, again, I'm just getting my initial idea out. You know, it was a rather, it was a rather, you know, rough watch through. I only watched it once on purpose. I just wanted to get that out uh, and see like what my initial reaction would be. And, you know, it, a little bit. I was annoyed a little bit at it. Absolutely. Now they did, they did move the documentary on into a number of other places too. They talked a little bit about tongues. I don't remember a whole lot of the discussion of tongues. I'm going to have to go through it again and, and hear that. Um, but of course they're playing all the like crazy tongue speech. I know there's a clip out there. Maybe if I can find it, I'll pop it in there where Kenneth Copeland and, and I think it's Jesse Duplantis are doing this just really odd, you know, tongue speak conversation in front of the congregation, in front of the TV cameras. And they're pretending like they're having a good old time having this tongue speak conversation. <laughs> that, that's not how tongues works. That's not how it works. That, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. But as continuationist believers who believes in the gift of tongues, uh, you know, glossolalia, as we want to call it, a heavenly language, for lack of a better term, it, that, that's a total abuse of the gift. And, and I'm not even one. I'm wondering if that's not even an abuse of the gift, if that's just them playing make belief for the fact of making something up. But again, again, this is taken as the norm. And this is taken as like, well, if you speak in tongues, this is where it's going to lead to. Uh, but that's not the case that you're just picking. It's just about picking the worst ones, the worst examples out of, you know, what's going on in the world uh, in order to make the case look stronger for cessationism. So in the video uh, of the number of cases, the two strongest cases they make uh, for cessationism, one is doing this broad brushing technique, which I said, which basically says, they don't say it like this in the documentary, but this is the implication is that these crazy things are because of continuationism and therefore continuation doesn't exhibit the fruits of the spirit. And so it's not true that that's, that's probably the main argument. Um, and then the second main argument, there's, there's a couple others in there, but these are the two main ones. The second main argument is that the canon of the scripture is completed. And because the canon of the scripture is completed, so we no longer, so we no longer need these gifts um, because everything is perfected and completed in the New Testament canon. That's the argument. The, the scriptures are complete. We don't need the Holy Spirit to speak to us in these ways anymore. So I, I was actually surprised. Um, they, they did use that argument, which I wasn't surprised about. But what I was surprised about is they didn't use the classic passage that is typically used to defend this view. So if you ask the question, well, where does the Bible say that when the canons complete, the gifts will cease? Typically, you'd be pointed to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, specifically uh, verse 8. And it says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with or will be done away. So what's the perfect? That's that's the question of the ages, right? So the argument for cessationism says that the perfect there is referring to the perfect completed canon of the scriptures. And so because the perfect is here, and like in verse 8 it tells us, it says that the prophecies will fail and the tongues will cease. 
But then they stop there and leave out the fact that knowledge will also vanish away, <laughs> right? Uh, but anyway, I, I want to save that for another video because uh, we can go into depths a little bit about that. But it's surprising that they didn't add this into the video because that really is the only potential scripture to support this sort of view. The idea of a closed canon uh, locking off all, all private revelation and prophecies and things of that nature. So they didn't do that. So so good on them. And I suspect it's because uh, John MacArthur may have had some uh, hand in the work here. And if you've read his book, Strange Fire, uh, he actually says that this is not a good argument to use on the side of the cessationist. Um, so John MacArthur, the cessationist of cessationists, himself would not use 1 Corinthians 13 as an argument to show that the completion of the canon is the end of prophecies and tongues and so on and so forth. Now, they did mention briefly uh, in the prophecy section uh, when it was talking when it was talking about the idea of um, false prophets and, you know, how do you get from the Old Testament where it talks about stoning prophets who get it wrong to now all of a sudden coming into the New Testament and then not having any repercussions at all for a false pro or for for a prophet who gets it wrong and makes me think back in in uh, I think it was 20, 2020 during the, the United States election. Now, I'm Canadian, so for me to watch the American politics just makes me laugh half the time. Um, but it became really relevant, right, when a bunch of people, a bunch of prophets, you know, prophets, air quotes. That's right. I'm a continuationist. I'm saying prophets and air quotes. I'm saying prophets and air quotes because, you know, they got up and they said Donald Trump was going to win the election. He was going to win the election. Um and of course, he didn't win the election, and pretty much every single prophet was wrong. And uh, to the credit of uh, maybe one or two of them, they stood up and said uh, and, and apologized for getting it wrong. Um, but I, you know what? That was a stain. That was a stain uh, for sure on the continuationist movement. Not because, um, not because that represents the continuationist movement, but it certainly shows some of the abuses and the lack of discernment that has happened in a number of circles. So uh, I I am with you there. I am with you there. We need to have discernment. I think I said that a few times in this video. But non but nonetheless, nonetheless. So the prophets fail when they give their prophecies. They're not always accurate. They're not always right. And so the documentary points this out and says, well, you know. In, in the Old Testament, they were stoned if they got it wrong. Uh, in the New Testament, they don't. And so how did this change? So they brought up Agabus. And the reason why is because oftentimes continuationists will take Agabus as an example of a prophecy that has gone wrong. And uh, Agabus was not, you know, penalized in any, you know, <laughs> exemplary way, right? I'll, I'll just read this. Acts 21.10. This is that little section there. It says, and as we stayed many days... A certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And so the argument goes is that uh, from the continuationist side, while well, he wasn't captured by the Jews and handed to the Gentiles, rather he was captured by the Romans and then handed over to the Gentiles. And so he heard the general gist of what was going on. Uh, he just got some of the details wrong in the prophecy. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that right now, but as it appears and as their discussion goes in the cessationist video, I mean, I might have to give this one to them um, because it does appear down the road that he was captured in such a way where, as Agabus had said it, that the Jews did up handing him over in to the Gentiles. Again, I'll cover that in, in a video in a little bit, uh, in, a, in another video down the road. Um, but the question of, like, what do you do with the prophets who get things wrong? And there is an answer for that. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, they were obviously stoned, <laughs> right? In the New Testament, I don't think we're to stone anybody for their heretical views or their false prophecies. But the general answer I would give. So when Paul is addressing this issue in the Corinthian church, right, he's saying, first of all, like the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So there's be some discernment going on there. And secondly, you notice that when the prophets get things wrong, it doesn't say they get things wrong. It just says they have to weigh them. But if a prophecy is weighed and it's not right, 
Does Paul instruct them to be stoned? I don't think so. Right? You, you go over to like uh, the, the epistles of John, right? And John is warning us continually of false prophets, right? You know, he's, he's warning us of false prophets. In fact, there's warnings of false prophets all throughout the New Testament. But here's the question. Do these people who are warning us of the false prophets tell us to go and stone the prophets? They do not, right? Now, those are obviously prophets that are outside the church. Now, what about the false? What about the, those who have prophesied wrongly inside the church in that Corinthian example? Right. I think the answer is overwhelmingly very simple is to have grace. Right? <laughs> That's Paul's message to have grace. Right. Bear one another's burdens. Have grace with one another. Right. Like the, this, this is the, the manifestation of the spirit in you is that you're gracious to your brothers and sisters in the Lord as a leader of a church. Right. If somebody gives a false prophet that is clearly not right, you're going to pull them aside and let them know, you know, that wasn't okay. And if there's a history of this kind of thing, then obviously you would forbid them from from prophesying in the congregation. I want to go into that in a little more detail a bit later, um, but for now, that's just to suffice. I'm just giving you my my uh, <laughs> my immediate thoughts on the film. Uh, it really portrays more of a popular view uh, of cessationism and. As I explained a little, a little earlier, it seems that the documentary tends to base, uh, tends to make more of a negative case on the continuationists as opposed to building a positive case for cessationism. And I, and I don't think they would be able to build a cessationist uh, case positively uh, from the scriptures. Uh, maybe they could try, but I, so far this documentary has left me not convinced. Obviously. Uh, but of course, uh, again, I'm coming into this discussion with some preconceived notions of what I'm expecting to see. Uh, and of course, my own presuppositions and my beliefs in uh, continuationism. So, you know, again, like if I just kind of give it like a, uh, <laughs> if I just give it a quick, like, you know, it's, it's put together really well. It, it kind of keeps your attention. Uh, it shares some of the more popular ideas surrounding cessationism. It's not very deep, but I think it's meant to address the issue more widely a little more shallow, but wider. So you're getting a little bit more, but not as much depth to that. And of course, that's what you do when you're trying to reach a more popular audience, which I think this this documentary is trying to do. Again, I want to emphasize, man, if you are a cessationist, right, I still love you as a brother in Christ. I don't believe that you have to be a continuationist to be in the family of Christ, right? And I believe that in order to be Christian, right, one of the questions is not, are you a continuationist or are you a cessationist? I don't think we're going to be asked that in heaven. Uh, the, rather, what's going to happen is Christ is going to come before the Father on our behalf and say that he had purchased us with his blood. And if we come to him and repent of our sins and turn to him and rest on him solely for our salvation, we can be saved. And so, again, I believe that there are good, godly, fruit-bearing Christians on both sides of the conversation. This is an in-house discussion. So I have reached out to Tim Cannon. He's the producer of the Cessationist documentary, and he is willing, uh, or at least someone from his team apparently is willing, uh, to come and discuss the Cessationist documentary uh, with a bona fide continuationist. Uh, now, of course, we want to keep that in the spirit of brotherly love, and I think the uh, conversation that we will have I think, and I hope, and I pray that it will be edifying uh, to both sides of the discussion. Anyway, brothers and sisters, I hope you found this discussion helpful. Just kind of off the cuff, some of the immediate thoughts I saw while rolling through the documentary the first time. Uh, again, I'm going to be going through the documentary a little bit uh, more thoroughly over the next couple of weeks, and I really want to interact with each of the arguments that are presented in it. Anyway, brothers and sisters, I hope you found this helpful. Click the like button, subscribe if you like what you saw, and until next time, we'll see you around.